WFM 91.7. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today on Women Lives Matter on Women Radio 91.7. My name is Sumto Titilayo Ajamma. Today on Women Lives Matter, we're discussing the roles of traditional structures in tackling violence against women and girls. Roles of traditional structures in tackling violence against women and girls. Women Lives Matter is an initiative of Women Advocates Research and Documentation Center in partnership with Women Radio 91.7 and funded by Ford Foundation. Traditional leaders, such as chiefs, are influential agents at community level. These chiefs are the custodians of tradition and culture of the people. Traditional leaders are in charge of providing leadership over the people They also ensure implementation of the laws and policies as their customs and traditions dictate in line with, of course, the national laws. To ensure that women and girls' rights are protected in our communities, we will be considering the roles of traditional structures in administering effective justice and care for survivors of sexual and gender-based violence. Once again, I am Sumto Titilayo Ajamma, and today on Women Lives Matter, my guest is here, B.C. Mekuye, Founder, Executive Director, Green Spring Development Initiative. And she's here to discuss with us on roles of traditional structures in tackling violence against women and girls. Hello, B.C., good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. It's, It's nice to have you on the program. Thank you. Thank you. All right, to join the program, to contribute or to ask questions, call in to 07000-917-917. 07000-917-917. Also, you can send in a text to a WhatsApp message to 0703-175-6537. Once again, the number to call is 07000-917-917. Send in a text or WhatsApp message to 0703-175-6537. You can also listen via the website www.wfm917.com. You can also download the mobile app WFM917 on Google Play Store and on iOS. Today, once again, we're discussing roles of traditional structures in tackling violence against women and girls. Women Lives Matter is an initiative of Women Advocates Research and Documentation Center in partnership with Women Radio 91.7 and funded by Ford Foundation. All right. Thank you again, BC, for joining us. And let's go straight into talking about these structures. What are these uh, structures that we can set up to tackle violence against women and girls? Okay, thank you very much. As we all know, the structure is, is critical. Hello? Well, can you hear me? We can hear you. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Yes. Because a structure is critical in bringing about law and order within the community or at the grassroots level. If there's no structure, things will just be going subsidiary. Um, our organization is one of the organizations that are implementing the fact that project of the World Sea. And um, what we have done at our own level is to set up a community response team, which is a grassroots based system and structure, which has been tried and found to be effective in tackling violence against women and girls. The members of our community call them as credible community-based men and women who have been identified and trained within our community to tackle violence against women and girls. So that is what we have used and it has worked for us. Hmm, okay. That's an interesting one. Do you advise that other, um, other? Do you, do you advise? Do you advise that this structure be elimin- be emulated in other areas as well, in other places as well? Actually, if you go within our communities, you will see that the 
the structure is already there. But for us at what thing, what we did was to formalize the structure. And we did a training for all those CRT members in order for them to work within the law and also to see that everything that they do, they don't just do at their own ways and capital. So the, the, the CRT structure is already doing within the community. But then um, we just decided to formalize it and mm -hmm. to give it that and semblance of formality and then uh, like a law and order. That's what we have done at all. Hmm. Thank you so much. So how do we narrow down these structures to the traditional level in a bid to end violence in the lives of women and girls? And firstly, the buying of the community is the foundation of whatever structure that is being set up. If you are doing anything within the community and you don't bring in the community, it may fail. So that must be carried along. The people of the community must be carried along in all activities and plans. For example, our CRT members are from the community. Hmm. And it is important that whatever we are doing is community-based in nature. You know, our culture and language plays a key role and it is very, very important. So for all, the CRT structure should comprise of community people who understand violence against human and health issues and who sometimes are victims of violence against human and health. So they are people that can be approached. So that is what we have done. Hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Then when you bring it down to traditional authorities, we've talked about I uh, talked about chiefs in my introduction and the fact that uh, the, these traditional authorities are the custodians of culture in these societies. And if you are a custodian of, a custodian of culture, when you, you would understand that a lot of things that we do in this climb are controlled by our understanding of what culture is. So as the custodian of culture, what, what are the roles that they play, that these traditional authorities play in tackling violence against women and girls? Yes, um, our traditional authorities, as we said, are custodians of our culture and tradition. For example, the Bali and Chiefs Council they are knowledgeable and conversant about issues within their community because that is where some of them have grown up. And then some of them were even, they lived in that community over years. They were born there, they grew up there. Mm -hmm. so they, they know the community true and true. Understand? So they know both the indigenous and the non indigenous. That they know the people that um, came to live within their community. Maybe they rented houses within the community. So they know all the people in their domain. So by that, they get information about early warning signs. You know, when something is about to happen, you will know, see the early warning signs. Mm -hmm. So they are able to curb and tackle all those incidents when they come. For example, violence against women and girls are reported to them. So they, they sort of rally around members within the community in order to meet it in the world. Hmm, absolutely. And and if you look at the situation of things, you realize that these traditional rulers have a say, these traditional authorities have a say in what goes on. So if if um, if they do have a say in what goes on, then what are some strategies or some measures that they can put in place in order to truly fight uh, violence against women and girls and to protect women and girls from further violence in future? Okay, so... Um what the traditional rulers can do actually is to see that uh, these cases are reported to them. Did I get your question well? Yes, you're answering it right. Please yes. go ahead. Yes. Can I, can I have that question again? Okay. So I said you, you've mentioned that they're the custodians of culture. So I'm saying that yes. what can they do? What are some, some measures they can put in place? to ensure that they tackle violence against women and girls as it is, and then they protect women and girls from experiencing more violence going forward in these communities? Yes, it's just to kind of um, strengthen that structure, the structure that is already on ground. Mm. Because the more sometimes um, we call 
those members within the community, we call them CRC, we call them community response team. We have trained them. Hmm. They are conversant about what is happening. So I've even gone ahead to train them on the violence against uh, uh, violence against certain prohibition law, the 2015 law. You know, it has some penalties and some articles within the doom and doom against uh, violence against people. So those traditional leaders can further identify people within the community and train them and even the people that people can people who have experienced violence can go up to, you know, and to see that issues that are violating their people that are violating their rights can be brought to book. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, thank you very much for that particular point. And to, to a large extent, you will see that um, traditional rulers are not the only ones that have something to do. They're not the only ones that have a role to play. Now, I'm coming to the question about yellow days and yellow jazz in these communities, because these people also, like it or not, they represent women. They represent women. They represent girls because they are female as well. I'm talking particularly about the yellow days and yellow jazz. So it will be, it will be, it will be. And it will be an unreasonable situation to see that there are Eyalodas and uh, Eyalodes in these communities, but they're not doing anything to solve the situation of violence against women and girls. So let me now ask, how has the Eyaloda and Eyalode in your community been working to to fight against the scourge of violence uh, against women and girls? Okay, like I said, under the World Peace we work in Makoko and we work in Otumara. Um, Makoko is in uh, Yaba mainland local government and Makoko is in uh, mainland local government. The Yaba mainland are all one community, are all, are, are all one local government. In Makoko community, we work with the Yalaji, hmm. who is one of our trained ELC members. And she's also the leader of our CLC in Makoko community. And she's very passionate about women issues. And for the mainland Yaloja General, we met her at the program at the National Orientation Agency at the mainland local government. We engaged her with the simplified VAP law that was, that was given to our organization by OC. We gave her some of the copies of the of the VAP law and mm -hmm. also took her through all the articles and the penalties that are there. So you know that these two women, they are very powerful in the community. Mm -hmm. The Yalaji talks to the women in the market and the Yalaja also talks to her women within the community. So two of them play a vital role and we have put them into good news during our first project. Hmm. All right. All right. All right. So let me now ask, within within the, the these communities, is the Iyala Iyala rather, is she a very visible um visible feature or visible presence that people know that okay, if they're ever in any situation relating to violence against women and girls, if they're ever if they're ever if that situation ever arises, is she such a visible yeah. presence that they know that they can report to, they can they, and she can speak on their behalf? Our ELG at Makoko is a visible woman. I will not say she's vicious because she does not when it comes to issues of violence against women and girls, she will tell you, I will not take it. Hmm. I will not take it. She will not go and bring out her back law. And tell them, see, I went to a trouble for a training. What she sent me to a training at the trouble, and I know everything that has to do with this law. Mm -hmm. If you wait in this law, it is your penalty. Even as a mother, your son or your daughter, wrong son of the law, it is in this law, it is in this that law. You will go for it. So you see that she's a woman that is passionate about issues of violence against women and girls, and the general court has. Hmm. The general court has a theology. Honestly, that's, that's very relieving to hear because there are too many... 
too many people in this kind of situations that because they're in these rural communities, sometimes they feel they feel blindsided. They feel um, overwhelmed because there's so much going on. But at the same time, you don't know who to report to in cases like this. So this is why uh, I asked this particular question. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, BC. It's 17 minutes past two on Women Radio 91.7, and this is still Women Lives Matter. Today on Women Lives Matter, we're discussing roles of traditional structures in tackling violence against women and girls. Roles of traditional structures in tackling violence against women and girls. Women Lives Matter is an initiative of Women Advocates Research and Documentation Center in partnership with Women Radio 91.7 and funded by Ford Foundation. If you're just tuning in, welcome, and you can feel free to join the conversation. The number to call is 07000 917 917. 07000 917 917. You can also send in a text or a WhatsApp message to 0703 175 6537. 0703-175-6537. I am Sumto Titilayo Ajama, and my guest today is BC Makuye, Founder, Executive Director, Green Spring Development Initiative. We're still talking on roles of traditional structures in tackling violence against women and girls, so you're very welcome to join the conversation. Now, in these communities, BC, what are some ways to prevent vi violence and to prevent people from, and to encourage people to report rather. What are some ways to prevent violence and uh, enable people to report cases? Okay, so um, you know, mediation is very, very important in all that we do. We mediate in matters. We go to advocate. We do advocate with the organization, to schools, to teachers, to the market to the churches, to the mosque. And then training too is very, very important. Mm. You know, um, when people are trained on issues, they are aware, they are educated. And the education too is very important. Let them know the deal on the deal. When you do this, this is what will happen. If you don't do this, this is what will happen. So mediation, advocacy, even the government, training, and education, mm -hmm. all of these are key in issues of violence against women and girls. Training and mediation. All right. So other than that, what else is important in order to prevent violence in these communities? Yes, and it's also, also to start from home because the say charity begins at home. We continue to talk to our children as well, we carry these messages to our schools, even up to the primary school, up to the secondary school. We keep on talking to our children, we keep on talking to them, talk, talk, and talk, and talk. Even in the churches, we talk to them. Even to the parents, we talk to them. The talking is very important. Advocacy, too, is hmm. very important. Okay, so training and mediation and uh, talking to children from home, right? Yeah. Hmm. So you're basically saying this is this is that situation where we cannot just leave things the way they are. We cannot just uh, teach our children from home, but somehow exclude the message of of um, teaching them to know better when it comes to relationship with the opposite sex. Because I need more details yeah. on what you mean by training, talking to them from home. What are some of those things that parents need to let their children know from the home front particularly, so that when they go out into the society, into these communities, they can have the kind of relationship with the opposite sex that would not have anything to do with, uh, that would not provoke violence in the first place and result in even more cases of, of sexual and gender-based violence. You know, for example, now, there's a form we speak to the children about their private parts. If you touch my private part, I will tell. Hmm. If you touch my private part, I will tell. I will tell my mommy, I will tell my daddy. If you touch my private part, I will tell. I will have told them that some parts of their body are private to them, mm -hmm. that nobody should tell. You know, um, people used to like our children before. But um, if you tell your mommy, your mommy will die, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen any longer. 
children now know that they are some part of their bodies are private that nobody should touch. And when they touch, they tell their children. So that one is already taken care of from the primary school and the nursery school. And then for those that are adults, the place of our love that we have cannot be overemphasized. They are very cheap in education to bring value to bring children and girls. When you, as a woman, know that when you smell your body, it's against the law and there's a penalty. And you, as a man or a woman, know that when you touch a woman in a particular place, mm -hmm. it's against the law and you can run foul of it. That's the place of education. You will know that you will not do such things because the law will take its course. So those are the areas where people can be educated and to reduce violence absolutely thank you so much uh, we're still talking about the roles of traditional structures in roles of traditional structures in tackling violence against women and girls that's still the subject of conversation today so if you're just tuning in this is where to be particularly if this interests you and even if it doesn't interest you you will understand that these situations are more common than you might think and even though it's not it might not be of interest to you today but you never really know when you would need this information so stay tuned and it's important that we um, follow the conversation. So yes, you can feel free to call in, ask questions, contribute, know how the traditional structures influence uh, violence against women and girls and how they fight violence against women and girls. The number to call is 07000 917 917. 07917-917. Also, you can send a text or a WhatsApp message to 0703-175-6537. 0703-175-6537. Yes. Thank you very much for staying tuned. We're still, this is still Women Lives Matter on Women Radio 91.7. Women Lives Matter is an initiative of Women Advocates Research and Documentation Center in partnership with Women Radio 91.7 and funded by Ford Foundation. Now, strategies. Um, BC, I was asking for strategies earlier. When I'm talking about strategies in this, in this uh, context now, there's no way we can talk about strategies without talking about uh, first responders. What are some f uh, some strategies that first responders specifically can adopt in ensuring that these traditional structures are observed? Is there anything that they can do? Do they have a say in the matter? Yes, as earlier mentioned, for us, um, our first responders, they should be well known within the community. And um, some of these First responders could be chief or prominent men and women within the community. Hmm. And then um, for us, I cannot but continue to talk about our CRT because it is um, a process that we have used that has been successful. So, what we did was to introduce our CRT members during our various community dialogues within our two communities. And then um, our CRC has ensured that um, violence against women issues are reported and adequately dealt with. And sometimes when issues are reported, mm -hmm. we invite the parties to dialogue. And then um, we have settled some cases just among them. And, and some cases have been referred to the authorities who have waded into issues and settled matters. So um, our structure within the community is to be maintained and observed um, within other communities mm -hmm. to have a lot of issues of violence against women and girls. Hmm. Still talking about um, traditional authorities and uh, first responders. Well, do the do the traditional or are the traditional rulers specifically are they aware of the efforts of the first responders and can they play any role in in um in am amplifying their work talking about amplifying by amplifying i mean in terms of resources in terms of publicity so that more people in the community can know about the the work of these first responders and and uh, what they do 
Yes, and um, most of our first responders, as I mentioned earlier, live within the community. They speak the language. Some of them are chiefs within the community, men and women. So they are people that are well known. And the good thing about um, our strategy is that the office of our CRT is in the Ballast Palace. You know, the Ballast Palace is an open place mm. where anybody can go to. So um, our balance within this community know our first responders. And even people within the community know our first responders. So issues of uh, violence against women are referred to them. And then in the simplified VAP law that mm-hmm. I mentioned that um, would be introduced and give to us, the telephone numbers of our key CLC members are in the booklet, in the VAP law behind. Their telephone numbers, their names are in the booklet. And the booklet was distributed to organizations within the community like Form 1, like the uh, Christian association, like the traditional leaders, mm-hmm. like the teachers that we work with within the community. Mm-hmm. So the telephone numbers of our first responders, especially the head of the CRC, is evident. And they themselves have distributed their telephone numbers within the community where issues of violence against women can be reported. So there are people that are visible within the community, reaching them is not an issue at all. Hmm. Interesting point of view. Interesting point of view. Thank you very much, BC. Now, let's let's now refer to organizations. Traditional rulers, traditional authorities, the the custodians, custodians of culture in these cases have a lot of roles to play. But another set of people, another set of or, or another element of um, the society that has a, a large role to play as well is organizations, whether corporate or non-governmental, these organizations have roles roles to play as well. So what are some of these roles that organizations can play in fighting against women, fighting against violence against women and girls? What can they do? Yes, um, both parties, both the traditional leaders and the organizations like play a kind of similar role. Like when it comes to advocacy, on issues of violence against women, when we see that a particular issue of violence is prominent and is wearing its ugly head in a particular community, what we can do as organizations mm-hmm. is to wade into the community, to begin to speak to the community members, to begin to advocate. If we see that violence against women in a particular case, like uh, maybe child marriage, because we have experienced that in our community at Makoko, we experience that many of some of the issues that we receive in Nakoko has to do with um, child marriage. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a particular tribe within that community whose culture is to give out their girls, underage girls, into marriages. And we have received more reports of that. So, what we did in collaboration with another organization is to, to do an advocacy to the men to go to them, to speak to them, to let them know the dangers of being out again and your early in marriage. So we do advocacy. And also we do some training, like our CRC member, we do some training for them. So we did that for us. And then we do a lot of education. We do a lot of talking to, we do a lot of mediation. So that is what we do as organizations and that is what we can do. And also, within this project, the survivors of gender-based violence, opportunities were given to survivors to be empowered. So we did some empowerment for some of the survivors of gender-based violence within our two communities. So that was what we did for some of them. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm really liking this conversation because it's shedding a lot of light on um, the roles that organizations can play. But if you look at it from a very critical point of view, particularly in the communities, some of these communities do not have partnerships or or affiliations with any uh, of these organizations. So 
is it the job of the traditional authorities in those communities to seek partnership, to seek uh, uh, knowledge from these organizations on what to do next when it comes to uh, fighting against gender-based violence? Or is it the job of the organizations themselves to seek out these communities and their traditional authorities, traditional structures, to teach them what to do in cases of sexual and gender-based violence? Yes. It is, um, sometimes it is our role. For example, when a game is violated, some of the community members don't know what to do. Hmm. So what we do is to tell them the first point of call is to take that child, firstly, if it is a bad one, to a hospital and a government hospital. Firstly, we take all the evidence not to beat her, mm -hmm. But we tell them that the first thing to do is to take that child to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Then after that, we now take the child to the police station. Sometimes we take them to organizations where issues of um, rape or the girl child is, is, is being taken care of around us. For example, those of us that are working in Yaba, there are one or two organizations where we take those um, girls to for medical examination and to the um, police station for reporting. So we, we, we talk to the women in the community that don't have this knowledge mm -hmm. for them to know that they can seek help in so and so places. Hmm. Okay, okay. And the reason I ask that question as regards whose job it is, BC, is because in these communities, Sometimes that, that idea of what to do just goes away when there's a case on ground. <laughs> Let me say this before I go on. So even if they have knowledge, you know, they know what to do, they've been educated, they've been trained, but sometimes when a case now arises and they need to apply all that knowledge to action, they, sometimes they might get stuck because they don't know how far they should go. They don't know if their decisions are affecting positively or negatively and they need to make the right choices. So that's why I'm asking, that's why I asked that question. Is it the job of the organizations to come to these communities or the job of the communities to seek out these organizations to acquire knowledge on what to do? For example, um, it was during this project that we got to um, work in a particular place in Makoko. We were working before. We worked in Makoku before, but we worked in the river, um, the riverine areas. But now, during this project, we are working. Um, what well, I call it, lunch. We are not working in the riverine area. I don't know whether you can hear me. There's yes. that, like background noise. I can hear you. Yes. You said you're not working in riverine areas. I can hear you. Yes, yes. So this, but this time around, we are not. We are working on the on the land area of uh, Makoko, and we find out that um, sometimes this community of people they don't know what to do in some instances. Some of them are knowledgeable; they know what to do, but some do not know what to do. And um, it's not only our organization that works in that community. There are several organizations that work there, hmm. but sometimes we find out that. Um, Culture is also one of the things that gives us handicap. When you take up some cases at times, it is the community people or the woman and the man himself who is at the receiving end mm -hmm. that will come to you and say they are no longer interested in some of these cases. So sometimes, even when they know what to do and they begin to do it, even when they know what to do and organizations come in to take up these issues, Sometimes we get frustrated by the uncooperative nature of even the people that have been violated. So that's a fundamental issue that we experience hmm. within the community. Definitely, definitely. I mean, one would assume that these these um, survivors would want to speak up, would want to uh, take their cases up so that they can get justice. But more often than not, would you say that that's the case in these communities? Would you say that that is the case in these communities? Would you say that survivors are willing to speak up without being prompted or without being cajoled? Or would you say that there's a, you, you find it harder 
to reach out to them to actually pursue justice on, on these cases? Well, for us, our experience in these communities have actually been fruitful. It is the victims themselves that approach our CRC. Hmm. Most of the cases that we have tackled within this project, the victims themselves are the ones that go to the home of the CRC to report some of these incidents. So they are the ones that reach out to us because they know that there's an organization that has a listening ear. There's an organization that is in their community. So you find out that they and they go to the CRC to speak just mm-hmm. hmm. All right. It only gets better. Thank you so much for explaining it in that way. And uh, I'm hoping that, you know, things get better over time. And this is not just in, in, in the community you're referring to, but this is in, in, in general, you know, that more more survivors, like you've said, that they don't, they don't uh, give you a hard time with prosecuting cases. They come to report themselves. You know, in reality, that's not much the story in a lot of other places. Sometimes, it, it, more often than not, it's always so difficult for them to report because of all the fear of stigma and how people would talk and the shame and all of that. So I, I'm glad that this is happening. And uh, hopefully more people take a cue from this and realize that it's it just easier and better to report these cases and let the relevant authorities do their jobs. 21 minutes to four to three on Women Radio 91.7. This is still Women Lives Matter. And today we're still discussing roles of traditional structures in tackling violence against women and girls. I am Sumto Titilayo Ajama and I have with me BC Mekuye, founder, executive director, Green Spring Development Initiative. Women Lives Matter is an initiative of Women Advocates Research and Documentation Center, WODC, in partnership with Women Radio 91.7 and funded by Ford Foundation. Call in to 07000-917-917 if you have any questions. Call in to 07000-917-917 if you have any contributions. You can also send in a text message or a WhatsApp message to 0703-175-6537. 0703-175-6537. Remember as well, you can listen via the website www.wfm917.com and you can also download the mobile app and you can listen live to every single one of the programs. WFM 917 on Google Play Store and on iOS as well. Coming back to you now, BC. What is the role of the Yalude and Yaloja in speaking up for women? I know I mentioned uh, something about Yalude and Yaloja earlier, but in this case, I'm talking about speaking up because um, reporting cases is one thing. Taking up these cases is another thing, and having people to follow up on those cases is another thing, to speak up and represent uh, these survivors in any of these cases. Would you say that this is something that the Yalodi and Yalodjas do, and uh, how far can they take this in a way to continuously speak up for these survivors? Yes, you know, um, the Yalodi speak to her women within the community. Yes. And the Yaloja also talk to her women within the market. Yes. And these are powerful women whose role within the community is very significant. They have control over their women. They are loved, and on the other hand, they are feared by women. And there are some places where these women, women can reach that the ordinary women cannot reach. There are mm. some people they can talk to that the ordinary woman in the community cannot talk to. So these are the women that speak up for women and girls within the authority. They can enter the governor's office. They can enter the minister's office. They can enter the commissioner's office. They have mm. access to the chairman of the local government. So these are the people and these are the places where they can speak up for women within their community. They can advocate. They can fight for their women. Mm-hmm. They can do things for their women. If there's a particular person that thinks is a single area boy within a community and is disturbing girls within that community, yes. these women have their way of reaching to the local government chairman or even the governor. 
to bring that person to book. So these are the ways that these women speak up for children or for women and girls within their community. Hmm. That's very instrumental. Thank you very much for that. All right, 7 is still the number to call. You can also send in a text or a WhatsApp message to 0703-175-6537. Once again, 7 is the number to call. Send in a text or a WhatsApp message to 0703-175-6537. Roles of traditional structures in tackling violence against women and girls is what we're discussing today. So call in, feel free to call in, send text or WhatsApp messages, and we will read them. Now, what are some, some structural traditional barriers that still exist for girls and women in our communities? Yes, I think um, the issue of stereotypes is still a big challenge. And then also cultural beliefs. You know, we hold on to our cultural beliefs and our tradition. I mentioned earlier that in one of our uh, communities, they still believe in child marriage. Mm -hmm. And they will tell you that is their culture. So they have to continue. But they, 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 they have forgotten now that there's, there's a child rights law in legal state. Yes. They believe that um, uh, they don't. They don't. They don't know that um, there are some things that they are supposed to do and not do. So they still hold on to their their traditional beliefs. So what we have done in cases of those um, traditional uh, early child marriage is to engage them with that law to tell them that these are the rights of these children, and it has got nothing to do with the uh, culture or tradition or religion, nothing to do with it. This is the law, and the law to persist your stereotype. The law to persist your cultural belief and your mm -hmm. religion. So those are the areas where we have issues. Those traditional practices, it's terrible. But mm -hmm. we have continued to engage. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, there's an incoming question. This question says, what can I do if I got beaten up by an, by an opposite sex. Uh, I'm going to link this one to in the communities. What can one do when, if, if they get beaten up by an opposite sex? I mean, would, would you say that this constitutes violence against women and girls first? And if it is, what can they do? Yes. Um, I would just like it to a particular incident that happened within one of our communities. The lady was beaten up, or she was beaten up by her uncle. Hmm. She was supposedly married to somebody that is from their tribe. And then one thing led to the other. One of her brothers-in-law slept with her. Hmm. And they now took up the issue. Her uncle, her brothers, her, her father's uh, her father's brother took up the issue and they believe that um, she brought shame to their family so they beat her up. Hmm. After beating her up, they now rubbed her oil on, on, her, on her body. So I just want to liken that issue to this person that has called in now. Mm -hmm. So what that incident was reported to our CRC and our CRC took the issue to the nearest police station that we have partnership with, and they summoned the brothers. Apart from beating her up, they're also trusting her with their traditional cultural, uh, this I don't know what they, this, uh, what do they call it in English? This Ebogun... Masquerade. Uh, they are, uh, this, they are traditional masquerades. Masquerades. Yes. They're trusting her with that traditional masquerade. So what our CRT did, was to take up the issue and we reported the matter to the police station and the family members were summoned and they signed an undertaking to desist from threatening her that they should leave her alone. So that is what can be done. Then another issue that is liking to her own was the matter of stalking. 
Okay. A particular, lady, a particular lady was being called by a man that uh, mother he wanted to marry her and all that. And she also reported the issue to the police station. They summoned him. They signed an undertaking to do this and stalking her. So her own issue too can be reported to the authorities. Nobody is above the law. She was beaten up. Is there an evidence of that of um, when she was beaten up? Did she report the matter immediately? Hmm. Is, there, is, is, there, is there a police report um, pertaining to that incident? So we need to know. Did she report immediately? Is there a police station close to her? Did she have marks on her body? Because these two incidents that I that I um, that I talked about now, yes. there were incidents, there were pictures. These two people have pictures to show of what has happened to them. And they reported the matter immediately. So what she should do is to report the matter immediately. And if she has marks on her body, maybe wound, mm -hmm. she can go to the hospital and also go and report the incidents at the police station. Nobody is above the law. The matter will be taken up immediately. As these two, as these two incidents were taken up in our community, as two can be done that way hmm. All right. And then also in that VAT law, the incidents of um, beating and giving mark on the body is in the law. There's a penalty that goes with it. So things can be done. Most of the problem, most of the problem we have is living for God. Mm. When something happens, we uh, feel it for long. There's nothing like feel it for long again. When somebody ends, there's a law that is against all those actions. And those people should be brought to book. Absolutely. We're not in an animal kingdom. Hmm. All right. Thank you so, so that, much. That is what she should do. Yes. She should report and there should be evidence of what has happened to her. All right. Uh, you, you, when you send that question, I hope you've listened and you've understood what was just said. So if you do have that kind of evidence, then please, by all means, make sure to report the cases. So finally... Oh, sorry, I, didn't, I didn't get that. The background... Um I'm speaking I to the person who that. sent in the message that I hope she has heard what you said so that if she has this kind of evidence, she can report so that the case can be taken up. So finally, as we wrap up, what is the role of the community members? Because the community members also play a role because they're part of the community. What is their role in enforcing these set guidelines about uh, violence against women and girls and about reporting cases? Yes. Yeah. Our role is to see something and say something and ensure that that something that is said is seen from the beginning to the end. You as a neighbor, every day you are hearing that child being beaten. When that child comes out, she reviews it. She's supposed to go to school. She has not gone to school. You are to report that kid. In the school, a child comes to school with bruises all over her body. She cannot explain. Every week she comes with bruises. Sometimes she does not come to school for two days. You should report the case. Even in your church, in your mosque, wherever you have found yourself, you should report. That is your duty as a good citizen. The person who is a victim may not know what to do. Hmm. But you, as an enlightened citizen, and you have seen cases of violence against women and girls. You know where that violence is coming from. From you can trace it. It almost rests on you as a good citizen to save the life of that woman or that child by reporting that incident. There's nothing. There's nothing that holds you from not reporting. If you don't want your identity to be known, you can go in another way. You can just send a letter or send somebody or send somebody that you know is within the community. Hmm. Maybe your landlord or tenant mm -hmm. or even the school authority. You can report to them if you don't want to be known to be the person that has come to report this person. You can just do it in that kind of way to cover your own identity. 
So it's for us to report cases to the appropriate authorities. Because we know the appropriate authorities around us where we can report these cases to. An incident was given of somebody, I just want to share this experience, okay. of giving to a man in another community outside, somewhere around Amu, the local government, that he was able to see the activities of some boys within his community. And he reported to the authorities, and it didn't come out well. Hmm. The information leaked to where it was coming from. So it became... Um, a target of those boys within that community. So he was not able to come out. He was not able to do all the things that he used to do. So we told him, you ought not to have gone yourself to report that case because you know how your community is. You could have gone maybe to report it to your landlord tenant mm -hmm. or to your church or to your mosque that can now go as a body to report that incident. So for us as ordinary citizens, if we cannot come out to report cases, let us report it to somebody or an authority that can take up those cases. So mm -hmm. our role is to see that issues for violence against women as community is reported as community members. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, BC. It's been a very educative episode. Thank you very much for uh, educating us and spending time with us on Women Lives Matter today. Please enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you so much, BC. As members of the community, we should engage and support traditional rulers and leaders in empowering women and informing their communities about the laws and penalties relating to violence against women. Traditional rulers should collaborate closely with the justice system, the police, social services and health care systems in order to effectively deal with perpetrators and compassionately care for survivors of, of violence against women and girls. Thank you very much to my guest, Bissi Mekuye, founder, executive director, Green Spring Development Initiative. And thank you to you for tuning in to Women Lives Matter today. Thank you to the producer, Esther Alaribe, and executive director, Tomo Okewale Shonaya. Women Lives Matter is broadcast every Monday at 2 p.m. on Women Radio 91.7. And let's join our hands together to end violence against women and girls. Women Lives Matter is an initiative of Women Advocates Research and Documentation Center in partnership with Women Radio 91.7 and funded by Ford Foundation. Thank you very much for tuning in again. My name is Sumto Titilayo Achamma. Good afternoon. <laughs>